name is Dario Kubler. I am the president of Asimov, and I would like to welcome you uh, to this uh, tonight event. Uh, just to make you aware, uh, today is the 1st of April, but uh, this is not uh, a Pesce d'Aprile, April Fool Day. It's a real event. It's a real event organized by us, Asimov. Uh, we are an Italian association uh, uh, based in Comerio on the Varese Lake. Uh, and uh, we welcome you to the Comerio Space Center. And you can see here some of, of the fantastic models, uh, real, realistic uh, uh, models we built uh, to Apollo capsule, uh, to Coma model, Apollo 16 and Apollo 11 the uh, 120 size of the uh, Saturn V rocket uh, we did uh, uh, for uh, several events. Uh, this is the inside, uh, the control panel that has been built by our uh, friends at Asimov uh, uh, with the instruments running, uh, including the computer, the Apollo guidance computer and the disk. And uh, um, we did other uh, great uh, things. Uh, for example, uh, as you can see, we did a, uh, a replica, one-tenth size of uh, the Starship uh, uh, that uh, uh, Elon Musk is trying uh, to make it work uh, these days from Boca Chica uh, and the Super Heavy. So that's the first stage. And the second stage you can see here is the Starship. Uh, we bring a piece of moon rock uh, two years ago around Italy, uh, and uh, we are also building uh, um, models of telescope. That's a Galileo Galilei first uh, canocchiale. Uh, you can see on the left, on the right, is the Fraunhofer fantastic uh, uh, telescope we use uh, for our entertainment with the kids and the schools. Uh, and then uh, we also built a replica of the Soyuz, and uh, I'm sure tonight uh, we will listen a lot about uh, this fantastic uh, journey. And this has been signed by uh, our friends Paolo Nespoli, Franco Malerba, and uh, uh, our good friend uh, Alfred Warden. And this is us uh, building uh, the Vostok replica, working uh, in the nice countryside in Varese. This is the vice president, uh, Eligio working on it uh, and other friends uh, who are cr creating uh, this fantastic uh, replica. Uh, we already show it uh, in one exhibition uh, uh, some years ago and we are finalizing the inside of this replica. But tonight we are here to talk about uh, the 60th anniversary of the first man in space with the live to, from uh, Moscow uh, and uh, we will listen tonight uh, the incredible story of the Soviet space program from uh, the grandson of uh, the uh, Glavny constructor, chief constructor engineer, Sergei Karayov. And uh, uh, I, first of all, I would like to thank the friends who helped us uh, building this uh, event from the Gruppo Astrografico di Varese, uh, APAN Observatory, Observatory of Suno, Galileo Galilei. We also have a Gruppo Astronomico uh, di Tradate, uh, AAAV, Asso Associazione Astrofili Alta Valdera, Observatorio Astronomico della Regione Autonoma Valle d'Aosta, and from our Swiss, Swiss friends, uh, Swiss Apollo. So it's a, a help from everybody that allow us uh, to go uh, through um, this uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, we will also have uh, uh, Paolo Calcidese from Osservatorio Astronomico uh, della Regione Valle d'Aosta. I don't know he is, uh, if he is connected. Uh, please, uh, Paolo. Yes, I am here. Then yes, I you know you, sh you should uh, switch to it if you want to say something. Good evening. Just a moment. Giusto. Okay. Paolo, ci okay. sei? Sì, ci sono. 
Ci sono? Vuoi che parlo in italiano, in inglese, come vuoi? No. Vi faccio un saluto okay. veloce in italiano. So, let me switch back. Okay, so I was told about Paolo wanted to say something, but uh, probably is not. Uh, Io sono qua, eh? Uh, Io sono qua. Let me see. Of course. Io sono qui. Something is not working. Presente. Done. Okay, so. Vabbè. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce to you the speaker of tonight, my friends, Professor Andrei Korolev. Andrei is an orthopedic surgeon, a specialist for Russia and for all Europe uh, about uh, sports trauma and arthros arthroscopic surgery. He's a well-known professor, uh, but uh, he is not only very famous in Europe because of his uh, profession, uh, he, he is also uh, extremely famous uh, uh, because of uh, his grandfather, uh, the Glavni constructor, Sergei Karayov. Welcome, and Andre, please, uh, your turn to share us the screen and gave us a great tour about what happened about 60 years ago in Russia. Yes, thank dear, you. yes, dear Dario, thank you very much. Do you see me? Do you hear me? Do you see me? Yes, yes. Thank Definitely. you very much. That's a great pleasure. Italy is a very important country for us, and uh, you will understand in a couple of slides why is it so. And uh, I'm sure that after we have so many Italian participants here, now I will have good connections in all parts of Italy, which is also very nice. I like very much the international connections. So hello, everybody. Buonasera. And I will try to share my screen. Just a minute. Yes. It's coming. Perfect. OK. You see me? Yes. OK. So, uh, hello everybody, and really that's like almost exactly 60 years of the world first manned space flight, space flight, and that was on 12th of April to uh, 1961, so almost 60 years ago, and the chief designer is Dario Tell, chief designer uh, of the Russian space program is exactly our grandfather, Sergei Korolev. And I will try to show you how he came, how he came from the child's dream to open space and space research, and how he became world famous. I somehow. Uh, I think you need to first right. to click. No, okay. no, yes, exactly. You did it. That's fine. <laughs> so many thanks uh, personally to Dario Kubler, who first uh, found. Uh, found me through our common surgical friends and I'm happy to see my surgical friends actually also as in the audience here and thank you very much for coming my dear colleagues and friends and not only surgical and uh, sorry with... Andre you're right I just spoke with Mario some months ago and that was like an, an big idea but we are not able to find exact date because of the COVID and nobody knew what is happening now you are closed, we are open. I just came from St. Petersburg from, from a wonderful belly. Sorry to tell you that, but it's like this. So Dario, thank you very much for your idea. But you have to give me the click on the computer because otherwise I'm not able to switch the slides. I think uh, you need to click on the slide, on the presentation, and then you can use but uh, then I need to do some uh, video. And how I can do back? Uh, maybe you need to, to click on the two arrows. Ah, okay, I found, I found it. It's fine. All right. Yeah. Problem. So a couple of words uh, about me. I am uh, really an orthopedic surgeon, so I'm working mostly on arthroscopic surgery and kind of space surgery through very small holes with a very long, not very long, but long instruments to do with the high precision, some very nice sports surgery. My wife, Helen, is architect and we live in Moscow, as you know. We have uh, a son who lives with us. 
uh, now he lives in works in London. His name is Pavel, Pavel Korolev. And that's me in my working room. I have the brother. The brother he is the full uh, name, copy name of my grandfather. So Sergei Korolev, he is a businessman. And our son, Pavel, is the investments analyst working in London, as I told you. And uh, why Italy is so important for us, because we have very special connections with Italy. And I hope our children and grandchildren somehow also somewhere in the audience. And we have the part of the family in Milano, our daughter Xenia and uh, Luca. And they have two nice children, Luca, uh, Edo and Camilla, Edo and Camilla. And in Roma, we also have a part of the family with Dina, Anton, Ivan, Ivan, and Alexandra. So greetings to all of them. And Italy is really very important for us. It was uh, space research is something really very interesting. And the first docks in space showed that it's possible to uh, organize a successful landing. And so it's possible to do that for the men. And the first dock was Laika. That was a great achievement. The Laika did not come back. But that was the first dog in the space showing that it's possible to work there. And uh, that's done as the questioner for the, for the uh, ch children and uh, elder audience, but it's not possible to ask the questions here. And then Belka Strelka, the translation of the names is squirrel and arrow. And there was the lovely dogs in the 60s because they were first dogs who were in space and then they came back and then they bring the new puppies in the world, and some of them got the American president and then the English uh, queen. And the first, oops, and the first man was Yuri Gagarin, as you know, that was really 60 years ago. And uh, that was a great event on the April 12, 1961. Uh, and there was not long trip in the space, but that was really the very first. And the second uh, cosmonaut, which I, I think important to mention, was Herman Titov. We knew him very well, was a very nice man. He flew just several months later, started uh, several months later than Yuri Gagarin, of course, less famous. I think that was kind, uh, quite difficult for him, but uh, he lived a long life and he was also a very nice pilot and a very nice uh, gentleman. And there was also a big, uh, big victory flight of Alexei Leonov with the first uh, in history open space flight. And that was on March uh, 18, 1965. And the first picture of the backside of the moon was caught in October 1959. And uh, of course, we are very proud. We know that uh, in the uh, as a head of the whole program was Sergei Korolev, the chief designer of the USSR space program, father of practical cosmonautics, twice hero of the so socialist labor. That's the biggest award uh, which uh, which would be given in the Soviet Union, and he lived a short life. He, uh, he died when he was just 59, but he did quite a lot. And we shall try to understand with you what uh, did we, uh, what did he do? That's me and my uh, younger brother, Sergei. Of course, our school life was also connected with the, some space visits. We organized vis uh, visits to different museums. We organized the museum in our school. And that's where going with the flowers to the school on the 1st of September. And that's the space museum in our school where we were studying. And uh, all our life from the very beginning was connected with the space, uh, with the space research and space. And of course, we are very proud to understand that our grandfather is, was Sergei Korolev, a really very famous Russian scientist, designer, engineer, the man uh, for, with his name, there are streets in almost all cities in Russia, there are, uh, or in Soviet Union, if you want, and uh, there are a lot of uh, monuments devoted to him. There is a city with his name, Korolev, in his picture, is always in the International Space Station as a uh, back picture for all 
uh, all astronauts and uh, cosmonauts. There are money which are issued with his name and a lot of other things. And of course, we are very proud of him. So what did he do? And uh, what is he famous for? He was the chief designer and not, not just all, but some of his achievements. He, did, uh, he was the chief designer of the first large ballistic missile. So large, which is not going around the globe, but with it for a very long distance for several thousand kilometers. First inter intercontinental ballistic missile, first Sputnik artificial satellite, first animals in space, first photo of the moon dark side. First man in space, first group space flight, first docking in space, first probes to Venus and Mars, first open spacewalk, first moon landing, and many other world records. And uh, really, we are very proud that Elon Musk is uh, often uh, names him and says that Korolev was one of the really very best. And we had a very nice and interesting, interesting chance uh, to have a family talk with Elon Musk. And I will tell you about that a little bit later. And uh, I'm not sure if you can hear. OK, we shall do it without the sound. So that was really on October 4, 1957 was the very first artificial satellite and the Russian world Sputnik, which means satellite, but the Russian world Sputnik is now well known and goes through the, uh, through the whole world. And interesting that for the Russian vaccine, which what you already know, they also choose the name Sputnik. It's not so easy to, to uh, check, to change the slides. So uh, that's map of Euro and, uh, Europe and Russian Empire. And Europe, in uh, comparison with the Russian Empire, was not so big at the beginning of the 20th century. And the uh, Russian Empire covered almost the whole Eurasia. And uh, in one of the cities, exactly in the city of Zhitomir, which is, this is Moscow, this is Minsk. So the Europe is somewhere on the left. And this is Kiev. And a little bit west from Kiev, the small uh, city of Zhitomir, that was the birth uh, place of Sergei Korolev. He was born in the small city in the Russian Empire, 19, uh, 1907, with a new style. You know that Orthodox has a little bit uh, different uh, time scheduling. And uh, actually, he was born on the New Year night, so December 31 old style and that was January 12th new style that his first picture which is uh, where he just six months uh, old and his mother was Maria Moskalenko a very young lady and his father was Pavel Korolev she was so young she was pushed to be married and she was married when she was six, seven, 17 and when she uh, became a mother she was just end of the 17, beginning of 18. And uh, she was very beautiful, very well educated. After this uh, pushed marriage, the life with the new husband was not so long, not very long. But that's uh, interesting that we still have in our museum at home her gloves, which, she, which are depicted here on her marriage photo. And the gloves are prepared now to bring to the uh, museum in Zhitomir, the city where he was born. I have some supplementary something on my screen. What is it? You see, kind of line. If you can. Yes, it, it looks like uh, you selected the paint or something. Uh, no, I don't think so because I don't have this selection. But okay, that's uh, fine. No, but uh, should should I rest, restart or? Yeah, if you want, to, you can you can close and restart, and see if uh, this is. Okay, just just a minute. Okay, now it's gone. You hear yeah. me? Okay. Yes. So the that was a, a family where they loved 
music, they understand, they understood the importance of the education. And that's one of his pictures where he is uh, just three years old. His mother, which is, who is depicted here with her three brothers, she had uh, two, uh, two brothers and one sister, and uh, she wanted to be educated. And so she does, didn't want to be just a home lady. So she wanted to go to studying to Kiev. And the small Sergei was uh, with the grandfather and the grandmother. Here he is five years old, they just started to write and you see his first letter, which is known to dear Vasily from Sergei. Vasily was his uncle. And uh, uncle, they didn't have a big difference in age. He had just 17 years of difference of age with his mother. And this was the younger brother, so even less, like 12 years of uh, difference. And they were like uh, close friends. And that's his uh, first school essay of Sergei Korolev, 19, uh, 1915. I take my exams to the schools. My grandfather was an old hunter. He lived in his house. There was a huge yard and a large garden, a lot of grass in the yard. There was a dog near the gates, five. So it was excellent. And he was accepted to the, uh, to the school. And when he was approximately at this age, he has seen for the first time the first airplane flights in Russia by the famous at that time pilot Sergei Udashkin, and he did the so-called uh, show, flight shows. So they came to the city, they sold some tickets, the people came to the big field. There was this uh, kind of old now airplane with the huge motor, very loud, very a lot of smoke, and he did several circuits around the field. Then he started, launched, did a couple of circles around the field, and then landing, and then applause, et cetera, et cetera. And so small Sergei has seen Sergei Utochkin, and he understood that his dr child dream is air, air flights, airplanes. And he started to work in, uh, and to think in this uh, direction. At that time, his uh, original family was destroyed. So because the, his father didn't want his mother to be educated and mother Maria, his mother Maria wanted to do that. So she left to Kiev to the high women courses. And that time the education was separated. And then later she met a wonderful man, Grigory Balanin. He was a very talented engineer, spoke, uh, was speaking several languages. And they were living together and they were close friends until the very late days of this nice gentleman. That's picture from 1912 in Kiev and Moscow in 19, uh, 1962. And Sergei Korolev started to uh, study uh, flying and gliders and airplanes. And that was quite popular in the Soviet Union. And uh, when he had a free time, he, uh, he visited the glider club and he was constructing and flying himself. And he is just uh, 18 years old when, when he constructed the first uh, glider and he got the special paper that he, he is the chief of the glider club and he should be supported in this. And then he decided to enter the university and that was 1925. And he uh, became the student of the Kiev Polytechnical Institute. And the Polytechnical Institute is a very famous institution, which is now in Kiev, in Ukraine. But Sergei did not feel enough of aviation studying there. And they expected uh, to have more knowledge and they, he found that uh, he can get more aviation knowledge in Moscow. And the family moved here. Interesting that after his move to Moscow, not connected with him, of course, but after this movement, they opened the aviation department in the Kiev Polytechnical Institute. But whatever that happened, the family already uh, moved to Moscow. Sorry, something happened. Okay. And uh, Sergei moved to Moscow and uh, he became the student of MVTU, Moscow High Technical School. And also he got there the certificate of glider pilot. He loved as before to glide. And he's just 21 years old at this age. He can construct, he can fly himself. And uh, 
he is uh, connected also with a group of flying enthusiasts. And this glider enthusiast meeting in Koktebel in Crimea in Russia, they have a very nice uh, mountain, which is I will try to show you. And you see here him on the picture uh, with the, oops, sorry, I tried to close something with a yellow screen, and he is about 22 years old, but he always thinks about flying. They meet in Crimea and they fly themselves. And the uh, Koktebel, glider Koktebel, which uh, he constructed and designed and constructed is in the air. And that's a picture of Oleg Antonov, the future famous designer of all UN airplanes, like all UN, which you know, and Ruslan and Maria, all were the results of working of his construction bureau. And Sergei, which is who is here, loves to fly and loves to pilot his uh, gliders himself. The, uh, this mountain in Crimea was interesting because uh, they didn't have enough money to get an airplane. There were not enough airplanes to put the glider in the air. So they started from the hill and there was, they had a, a very specific airflow from the sea. So they can start from the hill and then uh, the glider goes by itself. And the start was with a big rubber. And here you see the starting moment of the, of the glider. You see a, many strong men, they put in the strength this rubber and then when the, when the strength was well enough, somebody, uh, how it's called, cutted the fixation point of the glider on the backside, and the glider just started started from the hill. So that was quite uh, original, but the only way to do it in the beginning of the last uh, century. And one day, young Sergei found the books of uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who was the school teacher, but at the same time. He was absolutely genius uh, man in space research, and he wrote some books that was the philosophical uh, thinking, like which was called Cosmism, so something connected with space. And he wrote a book, Future on Earth and Mankind, and he showed how it's possible to construct the uh, spaceships and how it's possible to fly it, how to reach the first space speed, the second, etc. And Sergei understood that he is absolutely, uh, absolutely ill about the space, about the space research. And interesting, excuse me, about the space research. And at that time, he's a student, 23 years old. And being a student, he is, has a diploma work. And his diploma work was the military airplane, which was called SK-3, Sergei Korolev-3. And the father of his diploma or diploma supervisor was Andrei Tupolev, pretty famous at that time aviation constructor, whom he knew also from this glider uh, construction and from airplane construction. And later he became even more famous construction and <clears throat> a lot of Russian airplanes during the Soviet time, almost all Russian airplanes has uh, TTU, so Tupolev, Tupolev construction, Tupolev 134, 154, et cetera, et cetera. And even the copy of Concorde, Tupolev 144, was also the result of the construction uh, of uh, Tupolev Bureau. And Tupolev constructed a lot of Soviet, Russian, and uh, airplanes, including those which are flying right now. And uh, Sergei Korolev graduated from university in 1930. And we have in our archive, we have the copy of this, but just the copy, because the original was confiscated during his arrest. Uh, in 1938, and the copy he got just almost 20 years later uh, in 1954. And that's the Moscow Technical University at that time and uh, nowadays. And uh, Sergei Korolev also constructed the glider, which was called the Red Star. And uh, that's the glider in the, on the ground and the glider in the air. 
And interesting that that was also the first world record connected with his name because this glider uh, made three loops in the air, one after another. And the pilot was Vasily Stepanchonok. You see that that's quite a brave man. So the, uh, the task was to do one loop, but he did three. And that was first looping after starting from the hill. So it was done before looping after starting with the airplane, but from the hill that was never done. And that was done for the first, uh, very first uh, time. And then he, Sergei, met uh, a young lady, which he met actually in the school. They were studying together. Her name was Xenia Vincentini. You see, that's also the connection with Italy because her great grandfather came from Italy. He was a wine producer and he was also a very active young Italian. Unfortunately, we didn't find his roots in Italy. I can tell you, we tried to do that, but failed. Because when he came to Russia, he was baptized. And so in the baptizing book that was written that we have the new Russian man, Nikolai, 26 years old. That's it. And we have no understanding where did he come from. But he was young and active. And he organized the wine, <clears throat> wine, uh, wineries, winery and winery school in Moldavia, which was Bessarabia. Bessarabia was part of Russia. Now it's a country called Moldavia. And uh, so that's existing until now. And uh, here, Xenia is a student, and later he became, uh, she became an orthopedic surgeon, and he, she had almost 60 years of work experience, and she is the mother of our mother, Natalia. And Sergei is absolutely, absolutely crazy about rocket building. He devotes uh, all his free time to the uh, rockets and construction. And they organized the group, which is called GIRT, the group of engineers working on space research. And they construct the first GIRT, uh, GIRT 09 rocket, which, is, which flies 400 meters. And that was in 1933. And that was the official first rocket launch in Russia and in the world. And that's quite an interesting story. Of course, there were no soft landings. So after landing, the rocket was absolutely damaged. But the happy group, happy group is sitting here and they're happy with the flight. And in short time, after that couple of months, they organized the other rocket with more sophisticated construction, which is called GIRD-10. And um, he is just 28 years old in Moscow, 1933. He is already well known for his uh, rocket, rocket research. And that's why he was invited as a vice director in the so-called Rocket Scientific Institute, ERNI, or Propulsion, Propulsion Institute, which exists even until now. And again, that's 1933, he's just 28 years old. He already wrote a book, which is called The Rocket Flight in the Stratosphere. And that's his picture of that time. In 1935, April 10, uh, his daughter Natasha was born and that's his only child, only daughter. And she was growing and then she became the mother of us, me and uh, my brother, and here is, she is just three years old, and that's our dacha. Dacha, you know, country house, and in Russian we call it dacha. Uh, he's still constructing the airplanes, and that again, this hill in the Crimea, and you see the, uh, the geogra geography of this hill. That's a uh, hill like this, so they have always the upcoming airflow and that's very good for the gliding and until now that's the absolutely paradise for the people who like to fly for the with the gliders or parachutes or whatever and they have a monument on the hill and that's a pretty famous place in uh, crimea not a lot of uh, free time but when it's possible he do some small sports or he goes walking and here he goes uh, with the family in the forest not far from our dacha and skiing in the forest. At that time, he already started to work on the, uh, on the cruise missile. 
which was absolutely new, something very, very new in the world, military production. And the chief uh, ideologist of this rocket production was Tuchachevsky. And uh, Tuchachevsky was not so close to Stalin as the other people from old, uh, from old, uh, old style, I would say, who thought that horses are the most important military power. And Tuchachevsky was killed in the prison. And when he was killed, they stopped all the uh, working on the cruise missiles. And who knows what would be the history of the Great Patriotic War, as we, told, as we call it, or Second World War, if the missiles were in the army before Hitler invasion into Russia. Who knows? And you see the brave, uh, proud of himself, intelligent young man, Sergei Korolev. And unfortunately, after the killing and shooting of his former chief, the bloody Stalin big terror was close to him personally also. Stalin killed almost all famous people before the war. He killed uh, four fifths of the almost all generals. He killed all the marshals. They, uh, there was a specially military sign, which is called the hero of the Soviet Union. So Stalin killed almost all heroes of the Soviet Union before the war. And you know, from the history, they had the close connections with Hitler. They exchanged military delegations, et cetera, et cetera. Quite a dark story in the Russian history. And uh, he personally signed a lot of lists of people who should be killed. And that list, just a small sign, but just imagine with the red, uh, red pen, but just imagine thousands of people are in this list. That was a terrible man and a very dark part of the, uh, of the Russian history. And so young Sergei Korolev was also put in the prison. He was arrested and that's his first, you see his uh, that's sign of his sense, his personal sign. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty nice. I forgot the correct word. So very, very good writing. And that's his first questioner, June 28, 1930, uh, 1938. He's just, uh, just 35 years old, 32 years old. Just a minute. I lost. And he was put in the. That's his uh, first prison picture, and he was put in so-called Butyrska Turma, that's the pre pre famous from Tsar time prison, which is located almost in the very center of uh, Moscow. He spent there several months, and just uh, tried to combine these two pictures, to compare these two pictures just before the arrest, and here he is arrested. He doesn't understand what did he do because he did nothing wrong and he was arrested for nothing. And they say that he is absolutely guilty and he will be 10 years in the prison and five years without uh, any political rights. Then he moves to the uh, main, main KGB building and that call, time it called NKVD, People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs. The building exists uh, until now. That's the main building of FSB. Before it was called the main building of KGB. So questionable and uh, quite a dark. And here that's also a prison, the so-called internal prison, uh, also quite a dark part of the Russian story. And here we have in our archive the papers, the USSR Supreme Court, 10 years in prison and five years of no political rights and full confiscation of all uh, earnings. And that's September 1938, so a couple of months. Just three people, five minutes, 10 years. And that was also almost the death, uh, death order. 
And then he moved from Moscow, he was moved from Moscow to Novocherkask, spent several months there. Uh, also, no rights, nobody knew where is he. And then he moved he was moved to the other part, very far east, far east of Siberia. Just imagine Moscow is uh, somewhere here, St. Petersburg, Moscow, and there where he moved. And there was uh, many thousands of kilometers, very difficult geographically part of Russia. And that's Siberia, river Kolyma, gold mining which uh, which is with the name Maldiak and that was a real Stalin concentration camp for his uh, for his population officially that was called the working camp for people enemies and gulag of course if you know gulag if you don't know find it in the internet and you will read a lot about the russian story and siberia river kolyma uh concentration camp he is uh, mining the gold since that time he hates gold he cannot touch it he doesn't like gold and tries not to buy anything connected with the gold terrible conditions for living if the people were sent there there was practically the death penalty there was not almost not possible to survive being in the uh, gold mining, he writes the letters as everybody, Moscow to the Supreme Court of the USSR. I apply to you to investigate my case once more. I'm absolutely not guilty. A lot of things are written here because they didn't give enough paper. So just one sheet of paper, one pencil, that's it. He tries to show that he is not guilty, but that was not possible in the, to do it in the Stalin concentration camp. And we have in our museum his uh, personal cup, which he did himself. And on the cup here, you see S. Korolev, so Sergei Korolev. And he brought it when he was liberated many years later. He brought it from concentration camp, and now it, uh, it's existing in our home museum, and we show it in some different museums and exhibitions. And of course, that uh, cap was all the hard years with him. And again, Siberia, River Kolyma, our mother, Natasha, Natalia, visited all the places which are somehow connected uh, with the name of Sergei Korolev, and she also visited this gold mining and she put flowers on the monument there and uh, the thousands of people were killed in this part of uh, Russia which was working for Gulag. And just imagine that you were imprisoned when you are 33 and then you are free when you are almost 40 years old for no reason, just for nothing. Seven years of your life were taken by sadist Stalin. Of course, mother of Sergei, Maria, started from the very first minute to struggle for his liberation, for his freeing from the gulag. And he tried to uh, try letters and telegrams. And we also have in our archive his, uh, her telegram but understand what is telegram? Moscow, Kremlin to Stalin. What is the chance that this, uh, I would not say gentleman, this person will read? That's zero. And she is writing supplementary uh, to my letter from Free My Son, young, dedicated, talented engineer, working for defense, specialist in rockets. I beg you. And you just send it somewhere. And she told me, I remember her very well. I, she uh, passed away when she was 90, she was 94, I was almost 14, and I remember her very well, and we spoke quite a lot, she told me how she was waiting for four or five hours just to send this telegram somewhere. Uh, Natasha was quite small, my mother, <clears throat> and there she is uh, with the grand grandmother, with Marianne. And uh, 
Maria, so mother of Sergei, decided also to find some people who can probably can help to liberate her only and one only son. And one of these people was the Mikhail Gromov. Mikhail Gromov was a very famous pilot, polar pilot, and the whole country was very proud of him, young, brave, beautiful, high, very intelligent man, <clears throat> and uh, loved by the Russian government and by Stalin, unfortunately, also. And uh, my great-grandfather, Maria, so mother of Sergei, she found him and asked him to write some letters about Sergei. And that's a copy of his letter to the Supreme Court that please look again in the case of Sergei Korolev. And the other person who also uh, did a great help for the liberation of Sergei Korolev from the prison, and they were all connected from this glider piloting. They were all pilots and they knew each other from this cocktail Crimea piloting of gliders was Valentina Grizodubova. She was also a famous pilot, pilot, hero of the Soviet Union. Very nice, beautiful lady. Both of them, and uh, Mikhail Gromov and uh, Valentina Grizodubova, later they were quite often guests in our house and I remember they also very well. And she also, despite the danger of writing such letters, she wrote a letter that please check the case of Sergei Korolev. Maybe they were not able to write that he is absolutely innocent. They write check, maybe he is not so guilty as uh, you think. Please do it. And that somehow helped. And Sergei was called, uh, Sergei, yeah, that's a, uh, the sign of the chairman, Supreme Court chairman. Please, Comrade Ulrich, I ask you to check the correctness of sending Korolev to jail. And uh, that helped somehow, but they did not succeed to make Sergei Korolev absolutely free. Korolev was just moved from a very hard jail in Siberia to the other jail in Moscow, to the very special construction bureau of the other prisoner, Andrei Tupolev. Andrei Tupolev, despite his famous aviation work was also put in the prison and he was in prison and he was announced guilty and they organized uh, and then they had difficulties in the beginning of the war not enough airplanes they found him in the prison and he was ordered to organize the construction special construction bureau from in prison specialists and he named all the people whom he knew of course he knew sergey korolev you remember he was the father of his uh, diploma project, and uh, they found him. And they found Sergei Korolev in this Kolyma. They brought him to Moscow. And on the high floor of this building, which is existing now, there is on Radio Street in Moscow, there is the location of Special Construction Bureau of Internal Affairs Commissariat. So it's a kind of soft jail. It's again, uh, uh, people with a gun who don't allow you to go outside or guards guards and uh, not enough food they sleep there but at least they were not, not beaten and uh, on the way to this special construction bureau sergey is already 2 years in the uh, in the prison and in this special internal affairs construction bureau they were ordered to construct airplanes and they work also on the so-called rocket airplanes they put the rocket engine on the normal airplane and try to uh, get as quick as big speed as possible but that was not possible because of the construction at that time you know this flutter when the wings of the airplane started to flutter and that was not possible to get it, but that was a big step forward. And only in July 1944, there is uh, there was a special. He was liberated because he was also already, as you know, well known for the rockets. And there was end of the war, almost end of the war, and uh, the Russians knew that uh, probably they will get some rockets from the Germans. And Sergei was moved to the other uh, 
uh, other closed, almost jail construction bureau in the city of Kazan, that's Tatarstan. And that's his first letter to his mother and wife after releasing from prison to Moscow from Kazan. I did not feel before all the grace of what surrounds us, but now I know the true cost of the sunbeam, a breath of fresh air, or a crust of a dry bread. His letters are very interesting, actually, and very, very nice uh, to read, very poetic, I would say. Sergei Korolev in Kazan, look at these eyes. He really doesn't understand why he was he in prison for seven years. And uh, interesting that we also have in our archive the sketches of the rocket constructions done by him in this uh, special construction bureau in Kazan, 1944. The war is not yet finished. That's not still a victory day. He is thinking about the rockets and how to send uh, them to space. 1944, he at least liberated from prison and immediately he was sent to Germany, 1945 actually, that's a mistake, 45. Uh, to Germany, he got the subcolonial shoulder straps with two, uh, two stars and was immediately delegated to defeat Germany to investigate V2 rockets. And interesting that one of the American officers told him, you know, that for the simple subcolonial, you have a very high front face. And later they changed the straps for him for the full colonial, so with the three stars. And here, Sergei Korolev near the V2 engine in uh, Penimund in Germany, September 45. And uh, several months, Natasha and her mother, Xenia, were in Penimund also. And here, Natasha is uh, here also near V2 destroying destroyed parts. And Sergei Korolev always write to the military prosecutor's head office. And that's, for example, 1955, 10 years after the victory. I asked military prosecutor's office to clean my name from accusations. And only in 1957, he got a paper that from the military Supreme Court that he is not guilty. Just imagine, imagine less than six months before first Sputnik launch, 19 years after his arrest, already 13 years since his liberation just four years before Gagarin flight. And the Soviet Union, the Soviet government say, you are not guilty. Not, not sorry, you are not guilty. Just, you are not guilty. And August uh, 47, he constructed, he was the chief designer of the world for first a large ballistic missile, which started from the center of Russia and landed in Kamchatka, Peninsula Kamchatka. Uh, and 1957, that's the world, world first intercontinental ballistic missile, and that was the country nuclear shield. And that was the answer to Americans after bombing, famous bombing of Japan. October 4, 1957, the uh, authority of Sergei Korolev is really very great. Everybody knows that he is the most clever man in the space research. And uh, he was the chief designer also of the, October, of the first artificial satellite on October 4, 1957. And that was really a big event. You know that there was a radio transmitter inside which sent beep, beep, beep. And all the lovers of the radio on the short waves, they got this signal from the space. And that was really amazing victory of the Russian technique. And we have it. Uh... Andre, yes. <laughs> we Same. rescue from space. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and uh, that the world uh, first photo of the dark side of the moon that's connection connected with a very nice story which I tell you one day about one fr French wine dealer who promised one thousand of bottles to those who will look on the dark side on the moon. And Sergei Korolev and colleagues did it. And uh, the biggest crater on the backside of the moon has the Korolev name. That's he, That's the Korolev crater on the backside uh, of the moon. But that's the first picture 
which was done in 1959. Uh, and also uh, first animals that was a great, great achievements. And that was the most lovely young girls 61 years uh, ago, August 1960, because they have to investigate is it possible for the man to work in the space and to come uh, back safely. Interesting was also some years later, the first soft moon landing and the video broadcast from the moon surface. January, January 11, 1960, there was organized the fir world first cosmonauts corps. There was the best pilots, jet fighters actually, because uh, it was necessary to have quick thinking, quick reaction, high potential IQ, learning ability, and very important, height not more than 175 centimeters because there was not enough place in the capsule. of course were extremely proud of Gagarin and uh, in Moscow there is a monument which is the highest in the world monument to the really existing figure with the uh, normal anatomic features of the face so that's the monument to Gagarin and of course all the newspapers were devoted to this and the when Gagarin came in, in Moscow two days later April 14th uh, millions of people were on the streets. All the all the people stopped the work and went to the streets with the signs: "Fantastic, amazing, space is ours." You, Yuri, you are great. Moscow, cosmos, Moscow, Yura, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's uh, really was amazing, and you can easily, or not easily, find it in the YouTube. But that uh, was really uh, amazing meeting in Moscow and uh, they met in uh, Vnukovo airport and then they moved to the Red Square and there was open cars and the first open car was the general secretary Khrushchev at that time and Gagarin and all the people were uh, sending flowers to them and mainly to Yuri. The other story was uh, with the first woman in space that was Valentina Tereshkova. Uh, official version that they need a woman in space, not only men, and the official version was that she was a weaver, and so that means that she is from labor class, which was important for the Soviet Union, but that was not completely true. Uh, really, she was the young communist party local leader, Komsomol, and she had a quite a bad well-being during the flight. She vomited almost the whole flight. She didn't perform the program. And Korolev was very angry. That's all written in the uh, in the memories of his uh, uh, of his vice vice chief designer. And he said, "No more women in space, never." And almost for twenty years, there was no other woman in space. I don't want to say something bad, but that was the truth. And exactly, she personally proposed to allow two more terms to the existing Russian Federation president. So that was a difficult flight of the ladies. And since that time, for many years, there were no women in space. And Sergei Korolev uh, really did uh, a lot. He did for the first time in the world history, of course, not alone, but his colleagues. And a lot of people supported him in this research, but he was the chief designer and that was the first group flight two spaceships simultaneously and radio connection between them first flight of several cosmonauts in one spaceship uh, first docking in space first cosmonauts move from one spaceship to another and launch uh, launching in one spaceship docking landing in another first scientific space uh, ships probes to moon venus and uh, mars 
There was also a big victory, first man in the outer space. That was March uh, 17, 1965, when Alexei Leonov, Leonov, sorry, that's a mistake, Leonov, Alexei Leonov, uh, amazing man, very brave, very clever. And she, he left the spaceship to do the first ever open spacewalk with the great difficulties came, came back to the ship and then uh, landed. And that's uh, our son, Pavel, with Alexei Leonov and his, his later pictures. He was a very nice man, very talented, wonderful artist. That's, for example, he did himself. And that's, he did him, painted himself as well. And that's he during the original flight. Really very, very brave. And there is a nice movie, which I will tell you, it's a uh, time of the first, which I, propose you to see, of course, and you can uh, find it in the internet. And again, crowds of, uh, and again, thousands of people were on the streets when, uh, when Alexei Leonov was back. Unfortunately, Sergei Korolev uh, died during the surgery because uh, he had a very difficult uh, problems which were not known before. A small surgery was planned, and uh, then they found that the big surgery should be done. And he had some medical uh, problems, anatomical, because during the prison time, they broke his mandibula, so he was not able to open his mouth. And then the broken neck, so he was not able to extend his neck. That's why on all the pictures, he is like this. And when it was necessary to intubate, they were not able to put the tube inside the neck because they just were not over, uh, able to open the mouth. That's terrible. And he died during the surgery. Uh, the official announcement about his death was several days later because everybody was absolutely shocked by, this, by his death. He was a well-known constructor and of course all politicians and, and the other people knew him. And uh, his bearing was in the uh, Kremlin wall, and that was the highly leveled official uh, burning, burning, burning of the person. So they, that could not be higher. And all the chiefs of the government, of the Communist Party, they uh, participated in that. I was quite a small boy. At that time, unfortunately, and all the cosmonauts participated in the official ceremonies, and he was in the Kremlin wall, like it was in that time. Now the Kremlin wall is like this, and we come every year to put flowers on several dates, which we will discuss. His mother, who survived him for almost 14 years, Maria, and his daughter, his daughter Natasha, my mother, and uh, me. My son, Ser um, my brother Sergey, was born a little bit later. His mother Maria lived almost 15 years, and he, she was main bi biographer of Sergey Korolev and popularizer of cosmonautics. And his daughter Natalia, our mother, is the next main biographer of Sergey Korolev. And he is my mother Natalia on the Red Square, and he is she is in our uh, home museum. Academician Sergei Korolev, founder of Practical Cosmonautics, genius designer, outstanding engineer, talented manager, devoted his whole life uh, to a childhood dream, L left the bright mark in the humanity history, stays forever in the world history, and he is our great grandfather and great grandfather, and we are very proud to have his family name. He had exact plans for the future, fly to the moon, landing on the moon, orbital station near the Earth, open space walks on the regular basis, fly to the Mars. And we are very happy that there is a person in the world, his name is Elon Musk, who is worthy successor of Sergei Korolev works and really very, we are proud of uh, what is he doing. And that was an interesting story. We were watching with our friends the uh, launching of the Crew Dragon 1 on the May 31, 2020. 
And then my wife Lena said, you, we have to congratulate uh, Elon Musk with this launch. I said, it's not possible. Millions of people want to congratulate Elon Musk with this launch. No, let's try to do that. Uh, really, that's important. And I wrote uh, two, two letters. One letter to a guy, Russian guy who lives in Silicon Valley and ask, do you know Elon Musk? Maybe you can pass this letter to him and say, hey, no, 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 it's not possible. And then they had a letter to NASA and NASA said also, oh, you're crazy. Millions of people want to congratulate Elon Musk. And suddenly, two days later, a very surprising voice from NASA calls me and say, you know, yes, we passed your letter to Elon Musk. And he said that he will be very happy to speak with you. And we uh, found a date for this, uh, for this talk. And then uh, happened the following. Hello? Uh, yes, Elon, hello. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, we are the family of Sergei Korolev. I am Andrei, the grandson of Sergei Korolev, and he is my wife. And you know, the time slots in Elon Musk's schedule are five minute slots. We know that from the press and from everything. And I, when, I, uh, when I asked his secretary, how much time do we have to speak with Elon? She, she said us 20 minutes. And we are really were, we are really very surprised. And we spent 20 minutes in absolutely very nice family talk with Elon Musk uh and that was really nice he's a very nice partner in speaking he jokes a lot he gives you to say something then he gives the opportunity then he speaks himself and he told us that he is very proud of korolev name and many of his works based on the work of uh, sergey korolev and he asked us if we know what is the name of the main hall in the uh, SpaceX uh, Corporation, we said, no, we don't know. And he told us that's called Korolev Hall. So the main hall where all the people are gathering from SpaceX is called Korolev Hall. And that's really a very interesting, proud sign for us. And then we uh, went in the bed because that was late evening in our time. And that was middle of the day, his time. And in the morning, we got hundreds, hundreds of WhatsApp, SMS, whatever, and telephone calls, because during the night, he put on Twitter, that's the power of the international uh, communication. I spoke with Korolev family today. He was one of the best, and he put the Ukrainian name of Korolev and the Russian name of Korolev. And the next day, I gave hundreds of interviews on all the TV, because all the uh, newspapers and news channels, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, marked, have seen this sign, marked it, and that was really amazing day. Hello. Interesting, interesting that the next day I was on a bicycle tour with my clinic, and so I gave all the interviews, uh, being in in bicycle, in cycling, cycling dressing. And uh, memory about Sergei Korolev is quite strong. There is a city which is called Korolev, not far from Moscow, with a big star on the entrance of the city. There are monuments to him. And here we are with, my, uh, with our son Pavel near his monuments. There are scientific ships, oil tankers, uh, airplanes, and uh, airplane in Aeroflot. There is a biggest crater on the backside of the moon, as I told you. There is one of the biggest craters on Mars that was announced by European Space Agency, and we didn't know about that, but it has about 70 kilometers of in diameter and a lot of snow. So if you have problems with skiing, just ask us. We have a special place, and it's not closed at the moment. And uh, there are a lot of monuments in almost all big cities in Russia and the former Soviet Union. There are streets of his name and monuments to him and museums of his name. April 12th, we are very, very proud to say that that's the International Cosmonautics Day, the date of the uh, Gagarin flight. And that's one of the three most favorite holidays in Russia. What, number one, of course, New Year, January 1st. Victory Day, May 9 is the second, and Cosmonautics Day, April 12th 
is uh, number three. And believe me, when it's April uh, 12, Cosmonautics Day, we get as many congratulations as we get in the new year. That's interesting. Uh, there are a lot of also children and people coming and bringing flowers to his monuments and uh, memory boards and other places. And every year on January 12th, that's his birthday, hundreds of people put flowers to his monuments and memorial boards, despite a very frosty weather. Try to believe me, 12th of January is usually very cold in this uh, country. There is a house museum of Sergei Korolev in the city of Zhitomir, Ukraine, his birth city. And that's the, they also have the National Korolev Space Museum. And that's the most uh, visited museum is uh, in Ukraine. And all the child, school children in Ukraine must go through this museum. It's really very interesting. We should go there in a couple of days. We shall uh, see how it works. And there is the private house museum of Sergei Korolev in Moscow. He lived there for last uh, last eight years. And it's also very nice to visit. There is a fantastic space museum in Kaluga that 180 kilometers from Moscow. That's the city where Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, the father of theoretical cosmonautics lived. And the first building of this museum is very interesting because of several things. First, it was constructed uh, by the most famous architect in the Russia at that time, Barhin. The second, it was the first ever building in the world constructed especially as a space museum, number one. And third, our grandfather also participated strongly in the organization and construction, etc. And very interesting that all the exponents in the museum are not copies, that originals, because for every spy space flight, they do two absolutely uh, identical copies. One is flying, the other goes to the museum. So they have original, original details, original space uh, spaceships. Very interesting. The museum exists until now, and now they constructed the second uh, second part of this museum. And it will be opened on April 12th. We have also the invitation there, but I think the official celebration will here in uh, Moscow. In Moscow, there is a very nice space museum under this uh, flying rocket. And that's the biggest pure titanium uh, monument in the world. Just imagine that's pure titanium from the very beginning until the very end. And at that time, Soviet Union didn't uh, didn't I think didn't think about the money, so all the titanium was put in this, and there was enough titanium for the rockets, etc. And that's a very nice museum. There is a very new, huge monument to Sergei Korolev near the TV tower, so one of the most beautiful places in Moscow. And the museum is very nice, also with a lot of original and popular copy things and a lot of students and school people, uh, school children are going there. There is a space pavilion at the National Fair in Moscow, very nice with the rocket, copy of rocket standing there near the entrance with a very nice uh, exhibits inside. Baikonur is now in the other country, unfortunately that Kazakhstan, but it's still also the monument to Sergei Korolev. And that's the famous international space heaven and uh, I hope that will work for the long, uh, for the for many years and for a long time, uh, because there is exchange of astronauts and cosmonauts, and they will fly. Or they will start also from there. Sergei Korolev was twice nomin twice nominated for Nobel Prize. Not all the people know that for first satellite and uh, for for the first flight uh, manned flight in space for Yuri Gagarin. But he didn't get the Nobel Prize because despite the application of the Nobel Committee, because of his top secret position in the USSR and because Khrushchev, who was the chief of the country at that time, did not want to give this victory to somebody else. He believed that is his victory. Ideas of Sergei Korolev leave, new spaceships start, the International Space Station is on the orbit, regular open space walks, men and women, scientific space experiments, space tourism. He spoke about that in 1950s 
that was kind of like a joke. I remember how we hear that space tourism is a joke and now it's working. Without Sergei Korolev achievements, it was not possible to imagine today normal life like internet or mobile telephones and the permanent exploration of space and the permanent scientific space research is the best monument to him. There is the exhibition in the London Science Museum, which was prolonged. Usually they have exhibitions for three months. And this exhibition was working for almost eight months because so many people wanted to be there. And here we, we have been there for many times, of course. And uh, with our son, Pavel, who lived in London at that time, and my wife, Lena. And that was called Cosmonauts uh, First in Space. And that's for the Russian speaking auditorium. I would say the, it's interesting to see the TV uh, rain, which we have a big interview with our son. And that's what I told you my interviews about the speaking of Elon Musk in the, in the, cycling, uh, in the cycling clothes, because there was a corporate cycling tour for my <laughs> clinic. Oops. Sorry. And for also for the Russian speaking audience, I would advise you to see the Litres, uh, the audio book, Sergei Korolev is my father. Uh, find the BBC film, which is called The Space Race. It's very nice film from uh, about done about 15 years ago about the space race, like eight or nine uh, parts of the film. I like it very much, very honest. Definitely have the application of NASA on your telephone or computer. It's very interesting and shows a lot of uh, things, not only from American side, but also from uh, Russian interesting side. Find the Roscosmos official Twitter. I don't like fan of Twitter very much, but the Twitter of Roscosmos and Instagram also very interesting. Definitely find the movie, which is called Gagarin. Uh, you will find it in the YouTube. It's called Real Gagarin, two parts. They have the English uh, subtitles, so you will easily understand it. Definitely find the film, uh, the movie, which is called Kolima. Also in the YouTube, it has fantastic number of viewings, 24 million. In the Russian history of YouTube, it's the most, uh, most uh, shown or most seen movie in the YouTube. Interesting that our mother, she is not very fan of uh, YouTube, you know, but uh, she told us that she participated in some interesting film and then we found her exactly in this movie Kolima. So find it. It's very interesting. Birthplace of our fear. You understand a lot. And uh, here the original voice of Sergei Korolev after launch of, during the launch of Gagarin. <laughs> Yeah, you should be very brave to send uh, this uh, rocket into space. Oh, what happened now? And um, and so I hope that my uh, lecture will help you. And please always remember about the genius engineer, space designer, highly dedicated and a very strong person, Sergei Korolev. And best greetings from all our Korolev family from Moscow. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Спасибо, спасибо.